What you are about to see, quite frankly, has never been done before. Celebrities, media personalities, doctors, faith leaders, policymakers, and community stakeholders all came together to talk about an issue that's affecting over 80% of Black women in the U.S. It's time to unmute fibroids. The heavy cramps, the taking off of school because I can't get out of bed or my siblings couldn't get out of bed. I thought that this is what a normal period was like. And one of the reasons why I wanted to join this panel is I just found out that I had fibroids. Why aren't people talking about this? Like I just didn't understand and I felt very alone, very, very alone. And I felt like if I brought it up, you know, it was just, you know, being dramatic, you know, it's like, okay, so you're on your period, like what's the big deal? I've been suffering with fibroids for a very long time. At 36 years old, I was, you know, sat down by my OBGYN and she said to me, you need to decide if you want to have children. Um, because when you have this surgery, that party is over for you. Such powerful and courageous testimonies. This roundtable was curated by one of my favorite organizations, the Black Women's Health Imperative, who partnered with Hologic for their Project Health Equality Initiative. Up next, more highlights from this robust conversation, which was moderated by MSNBC's Tiffany Cross. Thank you for um, asking me to moderate this discussion. This is something that hits close to home, uh, as it does with a lot of our speakers. And um, it's so timely uh, uh, to have this conversation. I will share that I underwent surgery um, for fibroids uh, a year ago this month on September 1st. So this is a conversation I'm very much looking forward to being a part of. And really, as we look to, um, you know, accomplishing the long-term goals of ensuring equity for Black women. I have suffered with uterine fibroid symptoms from around the age of 14. Always really heavy periods. I was always that slim girl who had a protruding belly and people would be like, Tanika, I girl, are you pregnant? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> um, but it, it was, you know, I laugh about it now, but it was so traumatic growing up and having to deal with that. Um, so I was recovering from my first fibroid surgery where I had 27 fibroids removed. Um, and it was such a, a hard recovery. But once I finally, you know, was starting to feel a little bit more like myself, I, I looked in my closet and I realized that I didn't own any white clothing. And many people with uterine fibroids will identify with this immediately. I didn't own any white clothing because I knew better than to set myself up for an embarrassing uh, stain in public. The White Dress Project for me really came out of a desire to show up for myself and the people who were suffering with uterine fibroids. We need to continue to encourage women to be their own best health advocate because their voice is their power. And once you use your voice, you understand how powerful it is. So for me, um, the term um, fibroids is something that was regular in my household growing up only because, you know, I grew up in a house household full of black women. And um, I thought that this was everyone's experience because without giving my sister's personal information away, <laughs> um, most of us um, suffered from this disease. And so I thought that not only myself uh, and not only a few of my sisters, but, you know, this is just how a period was. And um, having um, insane amount of bleeding to the point where, you know, I, I became anemic um, the disgusting liver looking pieces <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. completely freak me out. Um, the heavy cramps, the taking off of school because I can't get out of bed or my siblings couldn't get out of bed. I thought that this is what a normal period was like until, you know, um, I, went to the doctor as a young woman and found out that I had fertility issues. And um, because of my fertility issues was because of my fibroids. And uh, I can talk about fertility issues all day. And I remember having numerous conversations openly about my infertility issues and not talking about the core problem, which was my fibroids. <laughs> you 
you know, and a lot of people want to talk about infertility because, you know, I think that that's a conversation that's more comfortable to have um, instead of having the root of the issue, which was, you know, the fibroids. And for me, it affected me, you know, mentally, especially when I'm on my my mental under construction journey, um, that I thought that it was something wrong with me um, until um, I knew that, you know, I had shared this experience with so many other, um, especially African-American women um, who had infertility issues. Nine times out of 10, they had fibroids <laughs> and mm-hmm. they had the situation, you know, since the, since they were younger, you know, in their youth. And the only advice that, you know, I can offer is to regularly get yourself checked out and um, do a lot of research. Um, When I was growing up, I didn't do a lot of research because like I said before, I thought it was just what our periods are supposed to look like or be like. And um, do a lot of research. And also, um, even after you talk to your doctors, do research on what they're talking about too, because always the end result is not a hysterectomy for the doctors especially on the panel you know we think we know our bodies and to tamar's point she thought well that's just how a period is supposed to be um i was fortunate enough to have a black woman doctor dr Uh, lynn lightfoot and i remember when she was talking to me about my options um i'm gonna shame myself and embarrass myself and tell you all this embarrassing story i have a couple but i'll share this one um (laughs) When she was talking to me about my options and she, you know, brought up a hysterectomy and I asked, I said, well, if I have a hysterectomy, um, where does the penis go? Because I really was confused about it. And she said to me, ma'am, a penis has never been in your uterus and really had to explain it to me. So I was still confused. And I said, well, then where does the tampon go? And she's like, tampon, no, you won't have a period anymore. And I had to tell you, I like this leaped out of my chair and said, sign me up for that one right there. But I was a woman in my 40s versus women in their 20s who are being, you know, faced with these options. And so that's not always a good option. On behalf of the National Medical Association, we're so grateful to Linda, to the Black Women's Health Imperative and to Hologic for the opportunity to be part of this discussion, this really important women discussion in women's health. And for creating the space and the time for us to come together, 80% of Black women will have fibroids by the age of 50. And fibroids are a disproportionate um, burden for our community. It affects us three times as often as white women. We're diagnosed earlier. We present with more severe disease, so larger fibroids and more severe symptoms. And we tend to wait longer to seek treatment as well, which can obviously affect our outcomes. And when we're treated, we're more likely to be hospitalized and have major surgical management as opposed to laparoscopic or minimally invasive options such as laparoscopy, hysteroscopy, and fibroid embolization. Socioeconomic status as race affects the care that women receive um, as in relation to fibroids. And women with private insurance are more likely to undergo a minimally invasive uh, procedure. These disparities in incidence and treatment options are especially important with respect to fertility and pregnancy during childbearing years for women of color. It's well known that structural racism and implicit bias by healthcare providers also impacts care for women. It impacts their ability to seek care and it ability, their ability to get quality health care. Access to care is also disproportionately affecting women of color, including access to knowledgeable and trusted providers. And while we recognize that Black women are affected in greater number, there is really a scarcity of data in research and little understanding why. The NMA recognizes the need for research and increased research in communities of color, diversification of participants, and importantly, diversification of those investigators that choose to do the research in these areas. Black women are vastly underrepresented in clinical trials and research, and we know that one size does not fit all. And one of the reasons why I wanted to join this panel is I just found out that I had fibroids. Um, I didn't know. And I actually went to the doctors for an MRI CAT scan 
for back issues. And while they were doing like the ultrasound and all the things that they need to do, they were like, we see these little things. So for, you know, two days, I'm like, uh, what, what are the, what, what do you mean? They're like, well, we need to get more images. So I'm, you know, my mom is lighting candles, making, trying to figure out like, you know, do we have to call in the pastor with the, with the anointing oil to make sure it's not <laughs> anything with the C word? And so, you know, it's really, you know, you're afraid because like I, I have almost very normal periods. It's almost like a little too normal. I'm like, yo, I, whoo, I will have triplets if somebody try to touch me. Like that's how normal they are. Like they every 20, matter of fact, twice a month. And so it's like not knowing that there's something you know, that there's fibroids in me. I was definitely like shook. And so I also have um, a black, uh, actually a Nigerian OBGYN. So I was asking her all the questions. I was like, well, what do I need to do? And I actually have a very close friend who is in her forties, still wants to have kids and was told that she has like 32 fibroids in her. And so she's done everything from going vegan, gluten-free, and I watched her journey and I, I'm not going to front. I was, I was afraid of that being what was going to be, you know, what was, uh, what they were going to tell me. Cause I'm like, yo, she's changed her whole life. And you know, the doctors are like, it can't be shrunk. Um, you know, basically either a hysterectomy or surgery. So she's trying to do everything the natural way. And I was just like, is that, cause I like goat meat. Like I, I don't really <laughs> want to have to change my diet. (laughs) But, you know, and so when you see, it's almost like it changes your life in a very, like it's a very intrusive kind of way. And, you know, while they're doing the ultrasound on me, I'm asking like, yo, how come no one talks about this? You know, how, like, did I miss the memo? Like if it really wasn't for her going through her journey, I think I'd have been tripped out. Um, And even when I was talking to my doctor, because, you know, there's one like, one right outside, you know, like, you know, my uterine wall. And so I'm like, is that, is that one a problem? She was like, they're small. We can, you know, just monitor them. So I'm like, should I get them out? And she's like, everybody calm down. You know, so it is this thing, this unknown that affects so many people. And, you know, I've, I've had friends where before they have kids, they're like, Hey, you know, we just had to have the surgery and but everything's okay. And so it's, it's like, they're not really saying what it is. They're just like, Oh, I had to get some things removed and you know, we're fine. And, and I, I think, you know, the more we normalize it and the more we talk about it. And also it's kind of like, well, is it because it affects mostly black women that we don't know about it? Cause like, what's the, like, what was that about? Um, and that's what my brain has kind of been cycling since I found out that, you know, I have it cause I'm asking all these questions and it's like, Hold up. This this don't feel right. Right. I mean, it's a pleasure to be with you all today, representing Congresswoman Yvette E. Clark, who proudly represents the 9th Congressional District of New York, which is Central and South Brooklyn. As Dr. Villanova said earlier, uh, we must continue to discuss the stats, right? Uh, today, approximately 26 million women and girls in the United States between the ages of 15 and, 20, and 50 suffer from uterine fibroids, with more than 15 million experiencing what is classified as severe symptoms. Over Of the 26 million, no group is more uh, impacted by uterine fibroids than Black women, who are twice as likely to develop fibroids than Hispanic women, and up to four times as likely to uh, develop fibroids than white women. To be clear, Black women get them at a younger age, they deal with larger tumors, as we heard earlier, and they experience harsher symptoms. Uh, This is why Congresswoman Clark introduced the Stephanie Tubbs Jones uh, Fibroid Research and Education Act. Uh, The legislation was really named after late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones of Ohio, who fought tirelessly to bring uh, attention to the fibroid uh, issue across our country. She first introduced this bill 20 years ago. I want that to really resonate with everyone. She introduced this bill 20 years ago. You know, with our modern medicine, we still haven't really uh, arrived at a point to solve this issue. And we're still calling for research on this uh, topic. And that's uh, that's unacceptable. I was really proud that the Congresswoman decided to move in this direction because the bill will really establish a new research funding through NIH at $150 million a year. So we can really uh, look into the root causes of uterine fibroids. The bill will also expand a CMS database on chronic conditions to include information on services provided to women and girls with fibroids. 
It will create a public education program through the CDC. And lastly, it directs the Human Resources and Services Administration to develop and disseminate updated comprehensive uterine fibro information to healthcare providers. This is not just an issue for women. A lot of my background is in reproductive justice, and a lot of times I'm the only man uh, at the table. I really understand that it takes us all to really come together to solve this issue. This uh, impacts our friends, our mothers, our daughters, wives, and our loved ones, and we can't let them down. Through the testimony of everyone here today and, and, and patients nationwide, that this is not a partisan issue. Um, you know, and what we're trying to accomplish through this bill, including more research, more public and provider education, tackling, eliminating disparities, and ultimately providing more options and awareness, um, it should not be partisan. Um, so moving forward, we are uh, doing our outreach to our fellow Senate offices, um, including relevant committee leaders, to get the word out about the legislation and get more co-sponsors, more supporters onto the legislation. So I want to give everybody a heads up. I'm going to show a picture that is graphic, but I think it's important um, to see this. And I just want folks to see this is what they took out of my body. Um, that came out a year ago. And what happened was basically I was told it was like a broccoli stalk, like my uterus had fibroids on fibroids on fibroids. And when I saw that, I, you know, your brain tells your body like, yeah, it's okay to panic now. <laughs> um, so when I saw this um, afterwards, I knew I made the right decision for me. So I just encourage people, because um, for a long time, I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to have surgery. I didn't want to talk about it, you know, uh, and vanity. The Lord knew vanity was going to be the only thing to get me uh, to deal with this because my hair was falling out. Now, the doctor was very clear. We can't say that your hair was falling out because of the fibroids, but that's a very consistent symptom. My mother lost like 70% of her hair when she went through it. And I called and said, why did you lose your hair that time? And she told me it was because of fibroids. So I knew I had half her DNA. That was the only thing because I would have lived through that pain. As Black women, we normalize all kinds of things. And I would have just been like, Tamar, this is just what I feel like. And this is what a period feels like. Wow. And that picture really kind of just shook me um, because, you know, you really just don't see it put in front of you that way. And as someone who also suffered through fibroids um, and declared infertile because of fibroids, it's just a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And, and as you stated, the church has really been the cornerstone in, in developing health programs to educate the African-American community since the beginning of time. Like it is um, statistically known that if you go to church, um, you live longer. So that's one way we can you can start encouraging more folks like yourself, Tiffany, <laughs> to actually go to church. But um, I will say um, what we've been doing, so there's uh, several different types of programs that we've been having. So we have an, an infertility program called Fertile Ground where we talk to women and young women in particular about their bodies. I cannot tell you how I was devastated and felt cheated when I was told, you're not going to be able to have your own child because of an issue that I didn't even know I had. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I've done everything right. I've, you know, went to school, I've, you know, eat right. And now you're telling me when I'm ready to start a family, that's not an option for me. And so I was determined once, um, you know, I had an opportunity and a platform that this was an issue that I was going to advocate on because of my profession as a federal lobbyist. I understood the importance of advocacy and I understood the strength of the black church. I mean, whether it's COVID, Baptist, AME, we all have health ministries and it's just up to us that we are a little bit more innovative in how we try to reach folks outside the walls. And we've seen that it can be done because we did it during COVID. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because it was the Black church that really encouraged folks from the beginning to get vaccinated. We took charge of that issue and then other folks jumped on. And so there's no excuse why, whether you're small or large, mega church or storefront, why we can't um, figure out how to work outside the walls of the church and partner with organizations like Black Women's Health Imperative, um, the White Dress Project, um, because there are organizations that are willing to extend themselves. The March of Dimes, um, Stacey Stewart, she talks about you know maternal health, 
but it, it's all tied in together. And if we decide to be a little bit more innovative in really addressing these issues and really tearing down, you know, we, we, we don't really talk about it in a way that resonates. We have to stop whispering <laughs> and really have true conversations. Like um, the young woman said when she was told or her friend was told, well, I may not be able to have a child because of this, or this isn't just fibroids, it's actually a tumor. Like we have to have honest and courageous conversation about these issues. And I think a lot of the churches are starting to do that um, more specifically about women and women's health issues and fibroids and infertility, because it's impacting us at and an outrageous rate. You all know the data. Um, but I think the church should be seen as a partner in um, encouraging others and educating our young women. Like, I was so devastated. I called my mom. I'm like, why didn't you tell me about this? Well, you know what? She had to have a hysterectomy at 35 because that's what they did. You know, she had her family and then they, the doctor said, well, you should have a hysterectomy. Thank God we have more black doctors. I mean, we're really um, leveraging our platforms to work with HBCUs, our HBCU medical schools. So we'll have more black doctors, more women doctors that can help educate our community. I'm curious your thoughts on the landscape as we deal with fibroids now um, and what advice you'd offer to people who maybe they have a doctor who's given them options that they're just not happy with. Um, what should they do uh, if, you know, if, if they're like, yeah, my doctor keeps pushing this hysterectomy, but I'm not so sure that's the route for me. Right. I mean, I think patients need to be empowered with all of the options they have for treatment. And if you're not happy with all those options or you don't feel like you've been given them, then you need to get a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth opinion. I think it's great that so many women here have had the opportunity to be under the care of a black physician. But, um, you know, it's unfortunate that only two percent of physicians are black females. So unfortunately, you know, while I hope that that changes. Oftentimes, people are going to see a physician that doesn't look like them, and physicians are going to take care of patients that don't look like them. And so you need to be comfortable with your provider, and you need to be comfortable and confident with what they're offering you. And if you're not, it's okay. You can get another opinion um, and, and be empowered that way. I think that's really um, helpful advice, the getting the second opinion um, part is, is so uh, incredibly important. Um, I'm going to bring in Cynthia Bailey if she's here. Hi, Tiffany. Thank you guys for having me. This is such a empowering uh, conversation, just listening to all these stories. My fibroid journey started when I first started getting my periods, basically. I always had heavy, heavy periods. I always had like to be pretty much shut down the first two days of my period. I could never go to school the first day or the second day. And even the, th the third day was a, a struggle for me. Um, as I went on in my life, I got pregnant with my first child. That was the first time I had ever heard of fibroids. My doctor, who was not a, an African-American doctor uh, during that time, um, just basically said, oh, well, you know, everything looks good. You know, I went for a regular checkup, but you have uh, see a fibroid you know, growing. So I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? Oh, it's nothing. It's just a tumor. You'll be fine. You shouldn't, you know, nothing to worry about. Um, what I would have appreciated in that moment was just a little bit more information, um, such as, hey, you know, this is something that you have, and it is more than likely going to continue to grow and eventually become a problem, which is exactly what happened. As I got older, the fibroids grew, um, they got bigger. By the time I was in my early 40s, I had just had enough. You know, as someone who's on television, it was very difficult to, to keep my energy up, to keep myself off of the baby bump list, because no matter how thin I was, even as a model, you know, I would always have just a little bit of a bulge. And no matter what I did, it was just always there. And, you know, my mother had a hysterectomy, so she really didn't have a lot of information. And she, I think it really affected her in a lot of different ways. When I look back at how her mental wellness was, just going through something like that with no real information, how that changed her life and her body. Uh, lucky for me, you know, like I said, I found out when I actually was going through a pregnancy. So at that point, I wasn't really interested in having more children. So that is not a part of my story. However, 
I felt like, wow, how is this, how is there not any real, why aren't people talking about this? Like, I just didn't understand. And I felt very alone, very, very alone. And I felt like if I brought it up, you know, I was just, you know, being dramatic, you know, it's like, okay, so you're on your period. Like, what's the big deal? And I felt like no one really understood what I was dealing with and going through. So one of the things that I'm most proud of is actually convincing production on The Real Housewives of Atlanta to actually show my UFE procedure. And I remember going to them saying, you know, because, you know, it's all about a storyline and this, that, and the other on a reality show. And I remember going to them saying, hey, you know, I really am dealing with something here and I want to get it taken care of. And once I started gathering information, I realized how many black women it affected. And, you know, I basically, you know, for the most part, I'm on a, a black reality television show. So I knew if I was dealing with this, I knew it was important for me to talk about it. And initially they were reluctant. They were like, well, you know, this is not that kind of show, you know, it's not about drama and whatever, whatever. And, you know, I don't think people really care about fibroids. And I really remember fighting to, to have them film it. And they did. And when I tell you everywhere I go, not even just in the United States, I have so many women that come up to me and thank me for talking about fibroids because they were ashamed to talk about it before. Um, just didn't really have a lot of information for some reason. Once I talked about it on one of their favorite reality shows, it just became something very comfortable for them to not only seek information to deal with it, but to also talk to their husbands about it because it doesn't, you know, someone said on the call, uh, on the, on the, um, in the conversation, how it doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you. Like I was, um, a very difficult person to be around during that time of the month. I was, you know, miserable. I was anemic. I think Tamar had touched on that. Uh, I was definitely a little, you know, you know, I don't like to throw the word depressed around, but I was definitely not happy. I, I can say that for sure. And, you know, I was just married. My sex drive was low. It was just really affecting, you know, I had no patience. You know, it's like my whole, everything was structured around, oh, I'm about to get my period. Oh, I'm just getting off my period. Like my whole life was about my period. And I remember one time specifically where, and I know you don't want us to take up too much time, but I just want to share the story because I appreciate the embarrassing stories, to be honest, because I think that's what people <laughs> that just brings it on home. And we all like, you know, it's like mortifying. But I remember being at a huge event for Bravo and we were like um, at this dinner and uh, what, we were at something and we were, oh, it was like a meeting where so I was signing autographs and doing that stuff and I couldn't go to the bathroom and I was on my period. And I was like, I got to, you know, definitely go and check in on myself in a minute because it's been a minute. And when you are dealing with fibroids, you know, it's like constant. Like, I mean, I literally almost walked around and it depends at, you know, the first two days. Mm -hmm. So I remember... Finally, standing up because I was sitting seated at a table, and as soon as I got up, I just felt like a whoosh, like just in my underwear. Yeah, and I just like panicked because we have people everywhere at this point. And I remember saying to my ex-husband, "I was like, oh my god, I have to get out of here. I have to go to the bathroom. I think I'm gonna, you know, bleed on myself." And when I tell you. By the time I got up from the table, I didn't even make it to the ele elevator. It was like a trail of blood. I'm standing in the elevator, literally in a pool of blood at this point. People are talking to me. No one's thinking to look down, and I'm just mortified. And I remember my my um, my husband at the time was saying, this is too much. He was, he was so embarrassed that this was happening. And he was like, this is crazy. Like, you can't live like this. And for me, that was the turning point. I was like, okay, I have to look. I have to get something done. And of course, the first thing I was told from my OBGYN was the hysterect hysterectomy. And although I didn't want to have any more kids, I didn't really want to have a hysterectomy. I wanted to know what my other options were. And I eventually found about found out about UFE. And that's what I ended up doing. And that that worked for me. I'm 54 years old now. Um, now I'm going through premenopause, so it's not an issue. But I remember those symptoms. And I think it's so important for us to keep this conversation going. Although it's not directly affecting my life so much anymore, I remember like 
those days, those years that I can't get back where I was just completely miserable. So I commend all of you for being on here today. And I'm honored to be here to continue this conversation because I think that's the only way to normalize it and to just, you know, really put all of these, put everything in place to really be able to be effective in helping people. I want to talk about something that um, Cynthia said as Dr. Duke gets herself together is the sex drive. I mean, because that's something that we don't talk about enough either. And I remember um, on my single ladies uh, on, on in this conversation today, I remember thinking because I just had, had like a series of bad experiences with um, with with men uh, not physically, but just emotionally. I'm like, you know, I'm just done with them. And I just want to arrive to this like, better level. I don't care about them at all. And then just like that, I lost interest in sex. And I was like, yeah, I'm like not even into you guys. Thank you. Cause I've evolved. And when I went to the doctor, finally, she's like, oh yeah, slow your roll. Like that's really <laughs> only because of your fibroids. And like when that what gets addressed, you'll be back out there thirsty in them streets, girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I remember in the moment thinking like, yeah, I've evolved. Like I prayed on it and like, I just have the desire anymore. So good luck girls. With this. <laughs> and that was not, that was not the case. Um, so Dr. Duke, I'm really curious why it impacts our sex drive that way. I mean, you've heard us talk about our different symptoms, heavy periods, hair loss, sex drive, cramps. Um, I mean, if you have one of these symptoms or all of these symptoms, you know, how do you know if it's fibroids and why does it impact us this way? Yeah. Well, you know, the truth is most of what you're describing in terms of those symptoms are really a result of anemia, right? So low blood counts. Our blood is what brings our hormones to every organ in our body. Uh, if you think about sexual stimulation in the female body, it's multifactorial. You have to be in the mood, yes, but you also need blood flow. You actually need blood flow coming to the clitoris to actually have that work in terms of sexual function, right? In terms of sexual desire, depending on how bulky or big your fibroids are, you might not actually like how sex feels in terms of penetrative intercourse because you feel full, you feel a lot of pressure. And so if that's what you feel when you're having intercourse, you're not going to be interested. So again, you lose that drive. And you also start feeling like you're maybe not performing as well as you used to. And that also would lead to you not feeling like you're in the mood. That sense of the depression that we're talking about, we know that a big part of female sexual arousal is actually part of our psychological arousal. And so if psychologically, you're not feeling interested, you're you're not feeling like you're going to be able to perform or enjoy the act, then of course you're not going to feel interested. So no sex drive. In addition to that, fertility is a big thing. And of course in black, in our black community, we have the black female fertility myth, right? And so that's another reason why we don't talk about things because we don't want people to think that there's something about us that we're not interested in sex anymore or that we aren't able to conceive on our own timing. And that's a big deal, something we need to talk about. I'm really excited that the church is here and we need to include all places of worship, not just the Christian faith, but we have to talk about this. We have so many sisters out there who are unable to talk about what they're truly experiencing Experiencing. Um, I love that we talked about Tamar, the normalizing of heavy periods. I myself grew up in a family where everybody was proud to talk about how my grandmother used to use bed sheets for her periods. That's just how heavy her periods were. So of course, there I was at 15, 16, struggling with heavy periods, getting very tired, very faint, right? Doing amazingly well at school, but having to work really hard to stay alert during the time around my period. And that's what we don't talk about. We don't talk about the fact that the anemia can lead to heart disease. It can lead to heart attacks because your body is trying to compensate for your low blood. Your anemia is leading to lack of nutrients getting to your hair follicles. So, of course, your hair starts falling out. Your skin starts changing in its quality. You can't work out the way you used to. Maybe you're working out now and you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm so deconditioned. I can't catch my breath on the treadmill when I used to do this no problem a few years ago. I'm curious about your experience. You just heard what the doctor said about the different symptoms. What were your cues that you had an issue and what was it like for you going through the medical process? Well, 
I was just uh, officially diagnosed with having fibroids, but as I've been listening to stories, um, I'm not sure if I experienced it with, in my mid-30s to my mid-40s because I had Graves' disease, and some of the uh, symptoms are overlapping. Um, wow. I had extremely hard cycles where I, too, had the white pants issue, and it was just like uh, just globs and globs until I just said, the f bomb word and i just walked and i didn't care who saw because i got tired of and it just and i just walked and i had nothing else to do i had no ride i was walking to the store i was visiting my son in college and i walked to the store just to get some snacks and then all of a sudden it just hit me and i just I, I was trying to cover up and i couldn't and i had about two blocks and as i walked like cynthia said there was just trails of blood and i had on white pants and um, a few people asked, uh, was I okay? And I said, I'm fine. I just need to get to the bathroom and clean up and sit on the toilet so my period can just keep going. And so I'm okay. And so after a while, I, I realized that my feeling about it was associated with my shame or um, the stigma associated with menstrual cycles because it was like a hush-hush thing in my family. Um, that was a very private and secretive thing. We really didn't talk about it. And so I kind of associated as I, when I was diagnosed with um, fibroids just actually about six months ago and I'm in menopause and I'm thinking I, I wouldn't have to go through this because I'm not on my cycle anymore. And I've realized that because of the physician that I had prior, um, like Cynthia said, it was not a big deal. Um, to be identified with having fibroids is like, oh, that's just something that you all get and don't worry about it. And now I have an African-American doctor who is very thorough and, and really focused on my care and how to, you know, help me deal with this. Um, because I'm in menopause, they're shrinking now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with that. So I have to be screened every six months to see what the next steps are. And so that was my journey with it. So I don't know how soon, how early I actually had it based on the two different um, illnesses that I have with thyroid Graves' disease and recently being diagnosed. So I'm not exactly sure, but I went through the symptoms of hair loss and um, kind of depression, um, um, low blood count, not understanding how I have low blood count and, and no one really associating it with my cycles. And so it, it was been kind of traumatic as I'm thinking about it now. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, wow, um, I, I didn't have doctors in tuned enough with the symptoms of fibroid to, to even um, start the discussion with me. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling a little slighted right now, mm -hmm. kind of emotional about it. Um, That's it's like I didn't matter that much to. You know, do we not matter as black women to really know exactly what it is that we're dealing with and how to correct it? It's hurtful being in, the, I mean, I'm getting a little emotional because it's yeah. just hurtful being in society where every turn I find as a black woman that I'm not cared for or cared about in society and it's hurtful. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just kind of hurtful to me. I, I, I I'm sorry. I'm, you are not alone in your tears, your frustration, your pain. First of all, I just want to commend you um, for sharing that story about walking to the store with the blood. I, I just, I, I can't imagine how that must have felt. And I cannot express to you, I'm sure all of us in this conversation have shed these same tears, Mrs. Durant. We have shared these same tears with how frustrating it is that we are routinely um, overlooked, disregarded, and discarded in a country that not only did our ancestors build, but we uphold this democracy. So trust me, your tears, you are not alone in those tears. I just have to keep it together because if I let it go, it'll be the ugly funeral cry. But I promise you, we are with you in your frustration. And thank you for um, just showing us how hurtful it is and reminding us that it's okay um, to break. I, I, I want to bring in um, Nichelle uh, Turner, my, my good friend, um, over at entertainment tonight, because, you know, Nichelle, as, as we see, um, Mrs. Durant's pain, I don't think it's foreign yeah. to any of us. I think mm -hmm. we've all been there and I can still be there based on some of the decisions I've made. And I'm just curious how you, 
um, navigate this issue? And what can those yeah. of us in the media do to help keep these conversations going and keep it a normalized conversation in the midst of trying to save democracy, uh, <laughs> you know, confronting these Karens every other second, like all the things we have to deal with, but, oh, let's, right. let's solve the issue of fibroids as well. Well, I, I do want to say to Miss Wanda, I cry those same tears with you. I mean, I am six weeks removed from my last myomectomy. It was, it's my third in 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been suffering with fibroids for a very long time. At 36 years old, I was, you know, sat down by my OBGYN and she said to me, you need to decide if you want to have children. Um, because when you have this surgery, that party is over for you. You'll probably have a 10% chance of having a child. So when I was 36 years old, I went through a mourning period of feeling like I'm not going to be able to conceive, you know, dealing with the, the thought of as a woman, you know, you're taught, especially a lot of times if you're raised in the church, that you're brought in on this earth to procreate. And if you can't, then who are you? Um, and so I really went through a mourning period with that. I went through a shame period because like you, um, Miss Wanda, it wasn't talked about in my family. Um, my mother had a hysterectomy at 38 years old. I didn't know why, but it was, she had fibroids. Um, and again, like, um, like the pastor's wife was saying that, that, you know, you, you just, they, our parents didn't know anything else. I mean, that was really a lot of times the only option they were presented with. And this last time that I had, um, a, a myomectomy on July 23rd, um, my OB was, was recommending that I have a hysterectomy. Um, but at 46, I still didn't want that. And, and like Tiffany, I'll show you all a picture. This is one of the fibroids that was taken out of my body. I had 24 fibroid tumors this last surgery. Nine of them were the size of um, from tennis balls to grapefruits, and 15 of them were smaller. And um, it's, it's, you know, you live with the pain. I know what everybody talks about, our, our heavy periods, the cramping. And like Tamar said, I thought that was a normal period growing up. I thought that's what everybody went through because we didn't talk about it. There was no communication. Um, so I think that the first and foremost thing we have to do is take the shame off, take the veil off. I was really proud of Cynthia when I saw during the Real Housewives of Atlanta that she decided to tell this story. I immediately identified with her because I was going through it at the same time. So I just think that we have to start the communication. Um, I, I just realized that I've still been kind of shaming this because when people ask me, I've been out of work, you know, for four weeks and just came back and I just said, oh, I just had surgery. But what I realized I need to say is I had fibroid surgery. This is what this is. This is how this affects. And so I've really been trying to be mindful of that, especially in the position that I'm in and tell people um, what is going on because you can't get funding for it if people don't know about it. And we have a responsibility in the media and I have a responsibility as a black woman in the media to stand up for my other black women, to stand up for, you know, um, sisters everywhere that, that have been, um, you know, disregarded uh, by the healthcare system a lot. So I, I want to bring in uh, Mervyn Jones next. Um, Mervyn, for those who don't know, is the son of the late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who represented uh, Cleveland, Ohio, in Congress and uh, uh, was one of just the most beloved members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, so, Mervyn, I know this is something that was uh, near and dear to your mother's. Um, heart. And so I just want to give you a moment to talk about keeping her legacy alive through addressing this issue. Well, Tiffany, I want to say thank you for as long as I've known you. You know, it's amazing to see your meteoric rise into what you're doing and working with my old professor, Jason Johnson from Hiram College. It's just amazing to see both of y'all work together. It's like, oh, I know both of them so well. <laughs> but um, to be brief, Fibroids have affected my life, not personally, obviously, but uh, my mother suffered from them. That's the reason the genesis of this bill. Uh, two of her staffers I still hold dear, uh, near and dear, Patrick Edmonds and Patrice Willoughby, were the leads on the bill at the time 20 years ago. And to this day, if, to have uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark be, a lead, be the lead on this bill is heartwarming. And that's why I say thank you, Christopher, and your team over there in making this possible. But to go a little bit deeper, 
we all know, it, well, I'll backtrack to my practice. With my practice, I have a client that deals with infant mortality and maternal mortality, and they're called Risk LD. And with that company, we talk about all the symptoms that lead to suboptimal outcomes to childbirth. And with that being said, fibroids have come up on numerous occasions in, numerous, in all of our meetings with uh, CBC members, uh, with non-CBC members, with you know, Democrats and Republicans. And there's, and there's a, a tone that needs to be addressed that has been addressed for both sides of the aisles and all races and creeds that are affected by uh, fibroids. But to go back to my mother, the reason why this is uh, so personal is because not to people, not too many people know this story is that my mother lost my sister years ago due to the effects of uh, childbirth and having large uh, fibroids. I haven't said anything about it. Only a few of my family members and family friends know about it. And for this bill to be to resurface in such a way and seen it being shot through Congress, through the House so smoothly, you know, I'm just here to happy to be a vessel to talk about it in my capacity, not as a lobbyist, but also as somebody who's seen not only my mother, women I've dated, you know, other family members, friends who are dealing with this now. And from my brief time working with uh, the Fibroid Foundation and with everybody else here on this call, I've been able to reach out to uh, talk to other organizations who are women-led tech companies, women-led uh, minority and women-led uh, financial services companies. So I love to be able to be a part of expanding this and making sure that all people who are nervous to talk about fibroids are having fibroids, um, and ultimately the men, because we have to sit there and be comforters to our women. We have to sit there and say, hey, what do you need? I started HUD, which is a digital health startup focused on connecting Black and Latinx populations to culturally competent healthcare providers and culturally informed healthcare services. And I started the company with no healthcare background whatsoever. I was a patient just like everybody else on this meeting. And I had discovered that I had fibroids. I also had over 30 of them. And I was in and out of the hospital. I lived in New York City at the time and over about a period of about six months, this was back in 2017, I was in and out of the hospital with severe abdominal pain and other symptoms. And during that time, I met with four different providers who were all white men who either dismissed my pain altogether or stated that my only treatment option was to have a hysterectomy. Nothing else was on the table for me. And, you know, I recall just going to the emergency room one day, I, I could barely get out of bed. Um, I had such severe pain and going to the emergency room and having a white male doctor dismiss me and tell me that uh, to just go home and take some Advil. And I, I said, we're, we're a little bit beyond that at this point. Yeah. And I was very adamant about getting a fifth and final opinion, but more so specifically seeing a black doctor and a black woman. And I, the closest referral I was able to get for a black OBGYN was in Baltimore. And I lived in New York City at the time. And I felt I live in arguably one of the most diverse patient populations in, in the world. Why is it so hard to find black doctors? And I, I traveled down to Baltimore. And once I did, the experience was a complete 180 in terms of bedside manner, in terms of treatment options. I ultimately did not get a hysterectomy. I had a um, a myomectomy, but that had never even been presented to me. But even as a young woman, I was in my 20s, just discovering, and I, I really didn't know much about fibroids. It's funny because, you know, once you get them, then you discover everybody has them, but nobody had talked about it before prior to that time. And just having a Black physician who walked me through what this meant for me as a woman, as a woman of color, and what my options were, it was completely, completely different than what I had experienced. So I wanted to create a platform for people who were like myself, who um, I, I'm sure at some point or another, we have all wanted to find a provider that looked like us and we, we know what that means and why that's important. And I wanted to create a platform that really created a comprehensive database that provided resources and providers to be able to, to make that search easier because it was not easy for me. What can be done? I mean, for, for those of us who have 
you know, told, well, you better hurry up and get a baby if, if you know, if, if you want to deal with these fibroids. Uh, what's your thought on that process? And for women who are facing that choice, um, what are the fertility options for people who've gone through it? Sure. So there are a lot of fertility options when it comes around fibroids. What a lot of women don't realize is that many women get diagnosed in their pregnancy. Um, it's the first time they're even hearing that they may have fibroids. With that, they're then offered a lot of options around uh, maintaining and having a healthy and a fulfilling pregnancy. So it definitely is achievable and attainable for many, many women. Um, fibroids is not a death sentence and it surely isn't a death of fertility. Um, but for many women, it can complicate their ability to either get pregnant um, or stay pregnant. And there are some complications that can arise just from having fibroids and being pregnant. Um, we have individuals such as Dr. Cindy Duke who are on the line who are reproductive endocrinology specialists. And when I have patients that have a strong desire for fertility and have fibroids, I usually like to partner with these individuals. There are a lot of people in um, spaces of healthcare um, that can be partnered in making sure and ensuring our patients meet their goals, especially when it comes to fertility. Fertility sometimes can be a silent symptom of fibroids. So I always encourage my patients, especially my younger patients who might not be trying to get pregnant, but not not trying to get pregnant um, and haven't achieved it in years to look into it. Because sometimes we don't know what we know until we know. Um, so engaging those resources, such as our reproductive endocrinology specialist, is extremely important. Um, engaging specialists like myself who are minimally invasive surgeons that can offer uterine sparing options, even when it seems quite dire, um, is extremely important. And then asking those questions early and being a, your advocate um, when you're saying to your doctor, I'm bleeding heavy, um, I'm having pain, something is changing about me, and they haven't offered or ordered that ultrasound saying, no, I kind of know that ultrasound is the next step, and I don't want to wait until I can't get pregnant to find out um, that something's going on with my uterus. Um, I just oh. wanted to echo what Dr. Hawkins mentioned about uterine sparing, because even as a conversation has ensued, there is such a gambit, and it's so frustrating to hear that it's just straight to a hysterectomy as opposed to all these other options. There are medical options, there are minimally invasive options, and even taking the focus off of fertility sometimes and do uterine sparing, because even if I'm undergoing menopause or I don't wanna have children, I may not want to have a hysterectomy. I still might wanna keep my uterus. There is you know, very valid feelings around and perceptions around you know, what it means to be a woman for every individual person. And so it shouldn't just be a, if you don't want to have kids, you can, you can do without your uterus. So you can have a hysterectomy myomectomy, but just basically building that awareness. And so that's one of the things that we do focus on. And that is important is conveying all the different options that are out there. So you can sit at, everyone can make the decision that works best for them, um, for their goals and what they, um, how they want to embrace this journey because it isn't a, it's a journey it's not a one time fix as you know everybody's been mentioning in their stories and even yourself it's not a one and done and so as they're going through this journey it may change i may not want a hysterectomy now i might want in the future i might want to do some medication options now i might want to do a myomectomy and so having that um, information i think it's very important um, to continue to encourage others to have those conversations and to advocate for themselves and to not rush into these decisions. Well, I think one of the big things is actually bringing this to the patients. And so as someone who hosts a number of fora where people in the general public can just come ask about their periods, it's called Let's Talk Periods Weekly. You'd be amazed at how many people don't realize the connection between their periods and their general health and thus, you know, the connection between your thyroid, fibroids, endometriosis, and how that all ties in. And of course, with that comes our due diligence, which is not happening right now on any level. Teenagers are not being asked about their periods, and so heavy periods aren't being caught in teenagers. Parents, mom and dad, don't feel comfortable talking about periods. How many of us know an uncle, a dad, a spouse, a partner who the moment you say period walks out the room? 
just doesn't want to hear it. We do need to normalize that conversation and get to the point where we explain that a period is a vital sign, just like your heart rate, your blood pressure, your oxygen levels, your period is a vital sign. And so everything we worry about, the period can tell us about, it can tell us about our health, our anemia, our hair, our skin, our sex life, and of course, periods. It's really the biggest, biggest window into your health and fibroid. So we do need to find more creative ways to destigmatize this conversation. And it needs to start with making sure that everybody knows we need to talk about periods. And before I finish, I just want to say we also need to include our trans men who are also out there struggling with heavy periods and fibroids and the conversation among Black trans parents. Um, patience just doesn't happen. I know when I first watched this discussion, I thought to myself, what can I do? And I know so many of you are asking yourselves the same thing. But the truth is there were very strong themes that came out of this entire roundtable. So first, we can educate our health providers on uterine fibroids and the black women's experience. Second, we can support the legislation to enable funding for education, research, and access to care. Also, we can have our periods become a vital sign. Wouldn't that be a game changer? I think so. And finally, we can all expand our awareness and our advocacy and put steps in action. Sign the petition, get the updates. Let's all come together to spread the content and awareness to unmute fibroids.